Hello and welcome to Prairie Pulse. Coming up a little bit later in the show, we'll visit Ukrainian Catholic churches in western North Dakota. But first, my guest joining me now is Dr. John Olvin, Sanford Health Psychologist. Dr. Olvin, thanks for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Well, as we get started, tell the folks a little bit about yourself and your background. Sure. Uh, I, I grew up not too far from here, about 25 miles south of here in the Christine Walcott area. I grew up on a farm. Um, I went to Concordia College, uh, and from there I went to the University of Kansas, and that's where I got my doctoral degree in psychology. And then I've been um, from there, um, came to uh, at the time Merit Care, that became Sanford Health, and I've been I've been at that place for 18 years, soon to be 19 years, where I'm a licensed psychologist and I'm the department chair of our adult psychology uh, group here in the Fargo Moorhead area. Well, with that said, you're here today uh, because May is Mental Health Awareness Month. And we'd like to get you to talk a little bit more about that. Why is this subject uh, so important? And why does May sort of shine a light on this to raise awareness? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I actually think the timing on this is really uh, it's really good. I think what what we've had, especially in this area, we've ha we've had a really tough winter, um, blanketed with snow since the end of October until just a couple weeks ago. And I think people who have a seasonal component, people who have been isolated, um, what we know is that uh, mental health can be really hard to manage under those circumstances. And and so when it comes to springtime, um, what ends up happening happening is that um, people can can still, they can be very depressed during those winter months. And especially when we think about people who are at risk of suicide, what ends up happening is as springtime comes, um, they still feel really depressed, but then on top of that, they're starting to get some of that energy back. And that energy, they can take some of that energy sometimes and, and use that for a suicide attempt. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think that highlighting that for this community is it's really good for this time of year for that reason. But I would also add that um, we've been um, working at Sanford for the last couple of years, on, and myself in particular, on some grant-based work to provide um, resources for healthcare workers who have been impacted by COVID. And through that, through that programming, we know some research that has demonstrated that the second wave of a pandemic is a mental health one. And so, and, and we're experiencing that now. We have increased demand for our services. Our patients are, we're, we're seeing patients with more complexity and more distress. And, and I think that this is, in some ways, this is, this is a perfect time for us to just pause as a community and think, okay, what are we doing to raise awareness? Yeah. With that said, uh, just briefly here, tell us about your practice. You know, who, who do you see and what, what are the, uh, you know, what do you try to help people with? Sure. So as a licensed psychologist, I work as part of a multidisciplinary team in our clinic. We're, we're located in the um, more, my team's in the located in the Moorhead Clinic um, there. So we have social work, nursing, psychiatry. Um, we have master's level therapists and psychologists. And like I said, I'm the department chair of that group, but I do a lot of clinical work. And in my clinical work, um, I'm, I'm working with patients who have, who have depression, different types of anxiety disorders. Um, I do a lot of trauma-based care, so people with PTSD. Um, and, and then in addition to that, um, I'm also doing, I also do some training. Uh, and, and I also, throughout my career, I've worked a lot with healthcare professionals. So I see, I see physicians and clinicians nursing staff who are showing signs of burnout. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, I've, and I also work with some physicians who um, have some comorbid uh, other conditions like substance use and, um, and, and work as, as part of that, um, as part of their treatment team. Well, and you talk about mental health issues and we've heard reports, especially in teens, that the rise during uh, the, the pandemic, is, is that, the, does data back that up or? It does. So um, the American Psychological Association puts out, a, a, it's called a Stress in America survey, and they do this survey every year. And uh, that, that um, where they, where they uh, gather data from thousands of people from different age cohorts. And, uh, that's, and this idea of the second wave of the pandemic being a behavioral health one, um, it, it seems to bear out in that survey. It looks like our, our teens are, are as, as the rest of us, are becoming more and more stressed. Um, they, uh, I, and I don't, I, I, I don't treat uh, teens and children. I, I primarily serve adults, but, um, but I'm certainly aware of that, of that trajectory. And I've got a couple of teenagers myself. 
Mm-hmm. And maybe I should def- you should define what mental health issues are and what range are they? Uh, do they fall in? A yeah, bit? a good question. So um, I think what, uh, um, especially when we're talking about, if we're talking about teens or people in general, I think it's the, what the question is, are we, are we stressed or do we, do we have a diagnosable condition? And, and the diagnosable condition, I mean, in a sense, what we're looking for is we're looking for the presence of symptoms, but in addition, um, individuals with a diagnosable condition are are going to have problems functioning in their daily lives, and so um, that's that's what often what I'm evaluating patients for when I when I'm working with them in the clinic and in the hospital, um, and and but that's but there are also a lot of us who are we we're just stressed and and so maybe where our functioning is okay but we're still just not ourselves, and so there's a there's there is a bit of a continuum around that. Mm-hmm. Uh, can you tell me the most common mental health issues with teens? Versus adults, I mean, is it different? Um, I think what I would say, I'll I'll, I'll, I'll put a couple of of what I find to be really um, provocative information that just um, just I just learned about the other day. So the Surgeon General came out with a a report that was looking at um, the impact of loneliness on 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 again people through the lifespan. And uh, this this data has really surprised me. Um, just a couple pieces to it. One, um, when we look at our teens or and young adults, so ages 15 to 24, if you compare their level of of social interaction for two decades ago to now, our teens and and young adults have 70 percent less social contact. And we, and along with this, this report found that um, people who have, who are lonely, um, it is, people who are lonely, it is the health equivalent of smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Um, that's, that's, it, you can calculate the same type of health impacts. People who are lonely, they are 30%, they have a 30% higher likelihood of having a heart attack, 30% likely high, uh, higher uh, likelihood of having a stroke, and as they're, if they have that through their lifetime, they have a 50% chance, a greater chance of developing dementia. And I think a lot of times people don't equate um, how people are doing socially with their health. But this report certainly emphasizes that point. Mm-hmm. So, again, what are the common mental health issues that that adults deal with that may be different than the teens? Sure. So, yeah, thanks for taking me back to that. So I, I, what I think about then is I think about this decreased um, social contact that, um, that we're seeing teens are, are especially experiencing. The, if we go back to that Stress in America survey, I, what we find is that our, our teens, are, are, they have more anxiety. They, um, so, um, and there are lots of different types of anxiety disorders, but that they're experiencing, experiencing more anxiety, um, also experiencing uh, a, a good deal of depression too, which is similar, similar to adults. But, um, but I think um, when it happens at such an important time in, in, our, in our teens' lives, when they're developing their identities, they're developing their social skills, um, it, can have, it can have longer uh, implications. Mm-hmm. So you talked about the stigma of dealing with, with and acknowledging mental health issues. Uh, you know, it, it's it, there is sort of that stigma. It, is it still the case, or has progress been made in dealing with that? I think that one of the one of the silver linings of the pandemic. Uh, I, I think that it was so stressful for us, and locally, nationally, that uh, that people are much more likely to acknowledge that they have a mental health concern. They're much more likely to acknowledge that at work. They're much more likely to acknowledge it with their family and their friends. And I think going back to that Stress in America survey, um, the the willingness of teens to acknowledge that they have uh, that they're having a mental health concern and their willingness to seek help is has dramatically increased over the last several years that they've been doing that survey, and um, and on the one hand we can take a look at that and say I'm, that's that's a bad thing because they're they're more distressed. On the other hand, we can take a look at it and think we really have to figure out ways to step up and get these folks care sooner, and and. And, um, and, I, and in that way, I think that in the long run, it could serve us better. Is there a shortage of mental health services in the state, especially when you get outside the uh, 
higher populated cities? Absolutely. Um, the, um, if, you, if you draw a map of, of North Dakota, what you would find is so the counties around, the county of, of where Minot's located, the county of Bismarck, county of Grand Forks, and then, and, and then here in uh, Cass County in Fargo, um, you would find that those areas show that they, they have enough behavioral health um, uh, workers, but outside of that, every other county in this state is um, is underrepresented for behavioral health workers, and um, and I, I think another statistic that I found just for the state of North Dakota is that um, teens who have depression, um, it, it's a very low percentage of those folks who actually get to care. And so, again, meaning that we've got a lot of our teens who are experiencing mental health concerns and, and they're not getting the help. Yeah. What about, I understand uh, there's a new virtual health care visit for behavioral health at Sanford. And how is this improving for, so clients can get sort of quicker care for, for their behavioral health and yeah. uh, from, from professionals? Yeah, yeah this, I, I think this is really uh, another, another silver lining piece from the, the pandemic. Um, we had to abruptly switch gears as um, behavioral health clinicians and start to offer care virtually. And so we've been doing that since, um, since essentially since uh, the, the, the pandemic set in. And, um, and within, with Sanford, I think what we're trying to do is we're really trying to build on that platform. If you go to our SanfordHealth.org uh, website, what you'll find when you come onto that page is you'll find there's a, a link that you can click on and you, from that link, um, you can schedule with a behavioral health professional. And, and so we're starting to build uh, at Sanford this virtual team. And right now we have, we have a couple of master's level therapists and we have a psychiatrist who are, are part of this team and just and doing um, only virtual care and and then within our clinics um, within the Fargo Moorhead area and the surrounding area all of our behavioral health um, staff are doing some virtual care mm -hmm. what about uh, what are some of the harder mental health uh, issues to treat I mean you, you talk about schizophrenia or bipolar um, can they be difficult uh, sh sure, sure. I think and it, when we, those are fall in this category of, of, of pers persistent and severe um, mental health disorders, and and yes, they they can be hard to manage. I think that um, I think that when we uh, are able to to really function as well as a team to help to try to address some of the psychosocial issues, the therapy related issues, and the psychiatric issues together, I think what we find is that um, as time's gone on over the last if we just look back over decades, um, our ability to manage those conditions, it's much improved. Um, when we look at different, it depends on the, the you mentioned personality disorders. Um, one that is a common one is borderline personality disorder. We do a lot of care for that for that uh, disorder in our clinic. And, and interestingly, I think that borderline personality disorder is, it's one of the um, disorders that we have evidence supported strategies to treat. We have a, we have a group based um, uh, treatment within our clinic. And there are a lot of different community providers who also have programming and treatment for that condition. Um, and uh, but but as you were saying, I think um, like like other health conditions that can be really difficult to manage, we we certainly have those within mental health as well. Yeah, can you comment at all about the advent over the years of effective medications, and you know some of those have really helped people. Mm -hmm. Sure. I, I think one of the things I feel very uh, lucky uh, and blessed to um, to have the team of people that we do at Sanford. I have I have a great group of psychiatry providers, and and with that, um, what we see and and what I I, I work uh, I often what my job is with with patients is a part of my job is to make sure that they're taking their medication regularly when they're taking it, looking for side effects, working with our psychiatry uh, teammates to try to figure out is this health Helping or not, and I think that we've seen a, a lot of progress in this way of, of having medications with with fewer side effects and and better treatment effects, um, and and have have watched just even in my so I've, I've been at Sanford for 18 years um, to just watch how we've been able to manage different conditions more effectively during that time. It's it's really it, it's an interesting time to be in mental health. Yeah, can can you uh, comment any about the importance of getting the right medication? and then staying on the medication. I do know that some people 
take their medication, feel better, and think they don't need it anymore. Sure. Um, well, again, to clarify that, I, I don't prescribe, okay. um, but, but I'm often working with uh, my colleagues um, who, are, who are prescribing these medications. And, and I think one of the things that's really, that's interesting about your typical um, um, antidepressant types of medication, um, what we find is that um, people will, st uh, sometimes they don't even pick up the prescriptions that they've been prescribed. And, they're, and they're, in our community, they're, that's mostly prescribed by primary care, actually. Um, but they, they might not pick Pick it up, and then they don't they don't take it long enough. So with many of these medications, you get some of the side effects first, mm -hmm. and if the patients don't understand that, they're going to get side effects before they get the treatment effects. They think, oh, I feel I don't feel good on this, so they stop. But they actually there's a small window of time that if they were to stay on that, a lot of those symptoms would settle down, and then they would start to experience the treatment effects. Let's get back to teen mental health for a moment. What are some of the key pieces of advice you give to parents to recognizing and then to, to deal with a teen that might be struggling with it? Yeah, that's um, as I was saying earlier. I've got a I've got a teen and a preteen at home myself, and uh, and I think. Um, I, I think it's one of the struggles that that um, that we have about going back to that idea of 70 percent less social interaction amongst our teens and, and young adults. We have to find various ways to communicate with them. So if that's um, if that it might be it might be the best way that you communicate with your son or, or daughter is to text them. Um, it might be it might be um, just trying to encourage that they have good connections with other folks, and um, and and and. But often things that we look for is we look for changes in behavior. Um, they're they're just not themselves. Um, often withdrawing, um, and and what's interesting about withdrawing is it's really hard to know what is going on. And, and it's hard to know when they need help, but looking for those changes in behavior and then finding ways to talk with them about, um, about how, um, how, how they're doing, how they're caring for themselves. And then, and then often it can be trying to figure out, are there resources through a counselor at school? Um, are there resources that, that um, they can access through their pediatrician um, or other, um, that, those can often, like the gateway through primary care can be a really important one for behavior health yeah so well it so help is out there so but we're out of time so if people do want more information where can they go yeah, I think I think our, our SanfordHealth.org um, website is a is a good place to go. I think that people um, uh, most people have a primary care provider, and and the, and our primary care that's where we do the majority of, of behavioral health care in this country. So it, it's our, those your your behavioral health or your primary care provider has the skills to help you, and uh, and they're they're ready. Okay. Well, Dr. Elvin, thanks for joining us today. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Stay tuned for more. Though small in number within the United States, traditional Ukrainian Catholic churches still exist. One small parish has churches in Belleville and Fairfield, North Dakota. Their Easter celebrations are a visual wonder to behold, and members of the congregation are passionate about their faith. When he rises from the dead, he is there again amongst us. What greater joy can we have than knowing Jesus is really alive? This is an unusual community. We don't have too many places in the U.S. where you have five generations of Ukrainians. Per capita, this is the second densest population of Ukrainians in the country. The Ukrainian Catholic Church, officially as we know it, started in 988 during the reign of Volodymyr. He had decided that his country should be religious, and so he sent delegates to the nations around him. 
and the ones that came back from the Hagia Sophia in Constantinople, they said when the liturgy started there, we didn't know if we were in heaven or on earth. And so he said, okay, we'll be Christian. The Ukrainian Catholic Church and the Roman Catholic Church are complementary. We don't have anything that contradicts our theology or their theology, but we emphasize different things. We have the beauty of the church, the icons, everything is chanted. We also emphasize the mystery of God in our churches. For those who have lost their loved ones, home. A deacon is a servant. First and foremost, the deacon is the servant of the people. The deacon is the transition point between the altar and the people, which is why I'm out on the solea leading the prayers. And part of the function of that is so that everyone else can be at prayer. The deacon is always directing with the orarian, the stole that's in my hand, so that everyone can just get lost in prayer. I'm kind of an MC. I tell the people what's going to happen. I tell them to be attentive to what's going to be taking place. And the priest follows, does his part all the way through. When we chant, we sing to God. Every song is sung. As you were in church, you understand where I was at. Cantering is um, assisting the priest with the music and the tones of the liturgy. We sing the tropars and conducts, and we answer the petitions, the ectenias. We're assisting the priest with the liturgy. It's a spiritual environment. As we experience Easter, we're all going to experience the joy with the words and the different melodies. We'll experience with the lights turning on when we sing, O Joyful Light. And everything, if a person really tries to hone in and tune into the words and the tradition, it all has a meaning and it's all helping the prayer. Easter, which we actually oftentimes will refer to it as Pascha, we have lots of services during Holy Week, a couple of services a day, each one different, each one rich in the meaning of what's going on in the day. We begin on Saturday before Palm Sunday, where we celebrate the resurrection of Lazarus, and then we end on Easter Sunday with the resurrection. The Ukrainian traditions are very much alive. The Pasanki egg tradition goes way back. Here you have an egg with a shell, so it represents the tomb. The shell, the white, and the yolk, it represents the trinity. A lot of the ways that they decorate the Pasanki have these symbols of new life on them. It takes anywhere probably from six to ten hours to do one Pesanki. Every egg is extremely special. You cannot make two eggs identical. Among the various traditions that we have in the Byzantine tradition are the blessing of the baskets and the foods that are associated there wonderful things that God created that we put aside for those 40 days of Lent so that we can reflect on all of that sacrifice that our Lord went through for us and now we're going to feast with great joy. And then our procession around the church symbolically followed the myrrh-bearing women's footsteps who defied danger, death, and despair to seek Jesus' body. We have not varied much in our church. We have not made a lot of changes in our church. Changes were made, but we have coming back to where it was. Each church probably has about a hundred parishioners. Not only have they maintained this for a lot of time because of the great faith of the people that are here, but I really see energy really happening to grow the parish. We have young families. And so I really see a lot of life blossoming, as well as we have strong elders here that have maintained the faith that are pillars to the community. The Ukrainian Catholic religion is really important to my family, especially the tradition part of it. The Pisanki eggs, they're bright, colorful, they're really fun to make. It's fun when we get to go home and go and eat all of this food in this basket that's part of our tradition. Our family believes in taking the Eucharist on the tongue. 
we've always been interested in the Byzantine Catholic Church. So when we saw how the Ukrainian Catholic receives it in the mouth, that was kind of the push we needed to try our first Mass and our liturgy. And after we went the first time, we really liked it, and so we kept coming back. It's really homey. We're all kind of so closely knit together. We all know each other. And during the Easter celebrations, it's really joyful. Christ is risen from the dead, trampling death by death, and to those in the tombs giving life. I really experience a connection to my heritage. There's been hundreds of people here for generations. So as I'm in the church, I do feel my ancestors, which is encouraging and it's really present to think how many people have contributed spiritually and physically within the church. Christ is risen. And He is risen. We have a lot of young people that left because of jobs. But when they come back, they always come back to this church. I feel that we are going to grow. Our church is never die. God won't let it die. And that's up to us to keep going. Christos Vaskras. This is a place where heaven comes and touches earth. So when we come through these doors, when we come into this place, we get to touch heaven in a way, and it's a very special and a unique way. Christ is risen. Christos Vaskras. Well, that's all we have on Prairie Pulse this week. And as always, thanks for watching. Funded by the North Dakota Council on the Arts and by the members of Prairie Public.